So you most likely have been hearing about this new thing. Um, it's, you probably heard it be called ChatGPT. It's from a company called OpenAI and it, and it just does all of these weird mystical magical things. It's just like an astonishingly capable writer. And without further ado, I'm just gonna go switch over to it and show off a little bit. Um, so it gives you this interface um, that's just kind of a, a big text entry place. And it's really wide open what you put in here. So you see their little suggestion here. I can say like, um, write an essay. And I do, I do control enter. It's the same as hitting the submit key. Um, so it's generating this just based off of my, my prompt here. And, and that's really the whole deal. You give it a prompt and it completes. It, it generates what it thinks should follow that prompt. And as you can see, it's fairly capable. It's still going. It's a decent writer without commenting on the accuracy of what is in here, it's good at putting together sentences in the right order and even um, paragraphs and, and, and entire essays. So what is it doing? Um, the best way I can come up with so far is to think of your, you know, your iPhone your, when you're texting, your um, autocompleter that's kind of predicting the next word that you're going to do. It is like that. Underneath it all, the technology is that just magnified to the 10,000th degree. So it's predicting not only the next word or the next couple of letters, it's predicting entire sentences and paragraphs. And it's been trained on so much content, so many gigabytes and gigabytes of text that it has seen patterns that is, it is attempting to replicate. And, and that doesn't really describe all the stuff that you can actually do. So let me, let me move this. Um, I have a little file here with a bunch of examples. Write a five paragraph essay comparing the flow of spice in Dune with US Middle Eastern oil policy. It's pretty decent. One thing you'll pick up on or read about is the three references it includes are utterly imaginary, totally and completely made up. So I have yet to use a URL out of here that works. It's also amazingly error free. This one is. Although I was running it a few times before this session, and it said that U.S. oil policy is based only on commerce and not on politics. So, you know. Uh, sorry, I should have been more, more specific. It's unusually grammar or spelling error free. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's what it's good at. Um, so Oops, you can either. give it a really vague prompt, and it does pretty decent. What I've been finding is that the more specific you can be, and maybe even breaking something down into smaller and smaller chunks, um, it'll do even better. So, Is it doing Google searches, Peter? Peter? It's not, um, but it has kind of ingested all the content it can find off of the internet. Come back. So similar to what Google did to index the internet, it has read everything it could possibly read um, and is kind of processing it and, tr and has, has tried to find patterns out of it. Good pretty good. If you, uh, if you put this into a translator, you, you can see that it, it, it did all right. 
Um, so, Peter, if we ask it um, very specific questions that would be the knowledge that um, humans right now would have about, a, a, say, a, an article from the 1940s, would that stump it or, or would it pull it off? And, and one of the extra credit assignments I used to give um, in in uh, Journalism 10 was an article written in the 1940s uh, about it by the person at the base of developing the web. Uh, but the questions that the students were to answer after reading the article were explicit. And they were also asked to expect something at the themselves in terms of the tools at the end. It, do you, with the playing around and that that you've done with it, do you think it would still do? You want me to go dig it up? Uh, do you think it would still do a good job? Or I'll yeah. I'll go play with it later. Okay. Yeah, I think it would if it's if it's general knowledge. Okay. You know, okay. I think of it kind of like Wikipedia. If it's general knowledge and it's not, you know, <clears throat> disputed. If it's not one of these hot button topics, then yeah, yeah, it's 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 going to have read about it. If you ask if you ask it who's winning the war in Russia, um, you know nobody writes anything who isn't biased on that topic, so it's anybody's guess. I think if it was from the forties, it might have been this person you were talking about. Yes, but it isn't his biography. It's an article he wrote, and, and it's widely published in, in the Atlantic and, and available. So, yeah, without going any further. Yeah, I think so. As we may think. But, yeah. but, but the, the questions I ask are very specific to asking me. And you think, and GPT is going to be able to answer those questions as well, right? You're, you're saying? I bet you it would do pretty good. And like I said, the more you kind of refine it, refine your prompt, or get specific and kind of do one topic per prompt, the better it'll get. Oh, okay. So in essence, as we play with it, we are also training it. You know, I believe that is true. I believe that's part of why it's free. Um, I also think it's free because this company has built this thing that's so utterly new that they're, they're a little mystified about what exactly their business model is. So they're seeing just what it is that people do with it. And... Um, Tens of millions of people are using it, so so I, they're probably getting a pretty good idea for what kinds of things they're using it for. Peter, I, li I listened to, um, a few weeks ago, I listened to a really amazing podcast um, from The Daily, which is through the, with the New York Times, and it was one of the, it was a CEO or one of the top guys at ChatGPT, that mm -hmm. worked on the invention. And mm -hmm. he was saying that exactly what was just said, that the whole reason it's free is because it's learning from us. Okay. Um, yeah. I have discovered a kind of um, anti-chat GPT, GPT mm -hmm. workaround um, that will not answer my essay prompts, which is um, write a three-page or five-page or whatever, however many-page paper in MLA format um, to answer blah, blah, blah. And it won't, it can't do it. Okay. Yeah. Five pages is pretty long. It's got, so it's got this system of tokens, it calls it. Um, and it's, it, um, the limit here is 3000 ish tokens kind of split between the prompt and the answer. So that's not a whole five pages, but you, but you or a student could approach it by breaking a paper up into sections. Um, yeah, math, it's, it's, not, it's not a math doer. There are some other very fancy tools out there that are, but, but this isn't it. 
it's it's um, has been looking for patterns. So you can kind of give it um, brain teasers or um, spatial questions about folding paper that a, a human can visualize, but it'll it'll just stump it pretty easily. So Peter, I got a question. Um, at first, we heard that there was a, a filter or a screen that could identify ChatGPT. And then later on, it said that that wasn't necessarily effective. What's the latest that you've heard? Um, I'll get to that. I don't think anything is ever going to be very effective. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think this one is going back in the bottle. I think it's it's only going to get weirder from here. Yeah. But like fundamentally, it's hard to prove somebody used one of these. Um, Peter, um, this, is, this is Deborah. Um, I hate to disagree with you, but I've already had students who are turning in almost identical assignments. Mm -hmm. That Yeah, uh, you're allowed to disagree with prompt. me. Uh -huh. So I've had to uh, change my prompts to include page numbers in the textbook, and then the chatbot cannot figure it out. Okay. Yeah. In, the, in that podcast that I was talking about, they said that that was one of the things that the guy said was that if, you, if it's a, a similar question is asked, even if it's similar, not even not just the same, if it's similar mm -hmm. answer is question is asked, it'll get the same answer as the previous question. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's why I'm encouraging um, spending some time with it yourself. It's not deterministic. You will rarely get the exact same answer, but, you know, run it enough times. Every time you run it, this this like a reload button, this just regenerates the same um, prompt. So you can even get slight variations and, and watch how they change. And I, yeah, I think after a while, you will get a good feel to, to what it's defaulting to, you know, if you have, say, an essay prompt or a discussion post prompt. Um, you will be able to see what it's doing. How about David? So I just want to clarify what Peter was saying in terms is it's, it can be quite obvious to you as an instructor that a student is using chat GPT. And as a matter of fact, you have almost like a hundred percent be sure. Even you use the software like uh, GPT zero, it will give you that the likelihood that it was written by AI is very high, but given the nature of what uh, GPT zero does, which is probability, you cannot use it as a, like, this is proof that it was written by AI. And the student can always contest that and you will get yourself into a battle that you cannot win because it will never be exactly the same. It will always be you know, slightly different and there, it will always be based on probabilities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this isn't plagiarism checking. It's true. Uh, Jan? One of the things, Martha may have been first, uh, but one, one of the things that I have done um, even before this technology, with students who uh, you would deny plagiarism, even with Turnitin showing them the marked colors, I will open up their work and say, uh, tell me what, what this word is, define this word, and why are you using it this way? Uh, and so to David's point, that is true that we can't do that um, using, uh, right now, we don't have the anti-GPT to like turn it in, to catch them, but we can question them. And if they did not write it, if, if, if language is used that they are unfamiliar with, and you've asked five, six, seven questions, of, why did you decide to compare this to this? What do you mean when you say this in this paragraph? Um, that if they cannot articulate their thoughts, they didn't write it. And so th there, there is grounds for demonstrating it isn't their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great coping thing. Um, especially if you do it, you know, verbally, just a couple of questions about what a student did, I think would, would make things pretty darn clear about if they wrote the assignment or not. Yeah, so simple questions with simple answers. Um, 
And can I jump in real quick? Um, yeah. I will say too, if you do a lot of scaffolding with writing assignments, you're watching their steps every step of the way. And so if you're watching this build out and then poof, they bring up something and they haven't even touched on it in the scaffolding, that's an indicator too. Uh, so I've been addressing it just through heavy scaffolding. Good. Yeah. That was when I, the, the very first day I learned about it, you know, I'm the, the iLearn guy. So I went to Kimberly Smith's English 1A class and I went straight to her final exam, you know, intending to put the essay prompt into the thing and see how it did. Um, I, right away, I could tell it wasn't going to work. It was building off of previous assignments and referring to specific things that she had done earlier and specific readings that were, you know, a little eclectic. Um, so, so her class was pretty robust to it, just right off the bat. Erin? Thanks, Peter. So what I wanted to say is that we're gonna be doing a workshop sometime in, in March that talks about ways that you can identify plagiarism, maybe not, you know, like, Proof that you would see like on turn it in but a suspected plagiarism where you're, you're just like something's not right this doesn't seem like the student's voice or whatever so the workshop that we're going to be doing is going to talk about how to identify that how to um, determine when you don't have like concrete evidence or super empiric evidence so people who who like jan and tiffany who build that sort of stuff into their uh evaluations um, it would be great to have you there so that you can contribute to some of the ways that you do that. Cause we're going to be, there's a lot of different ways to do it. And so we're going to be spending a lot of time talking about it. So that invite will go out sometime in the next couple of weeks, I guess. That's all. Thanks. Right on. And um, Chanda, did you have your hand raised? Um, yeah. Hi, Peter. Um, so I was wondering, have you tried, like you tried it with the English class? Have you tried it with any coding class? Uh, oh, coding is just amazing. Um, yeah, I've tried it with another side job of mine, writing, starting a script in a language that I don't even know, you know, do Windows PowerShell to do this and this, um, ran the output, and it worked right off the bat, and I was able to modify it to do exactly what I wanted, um, write a web page that has two columns and some graphics, did it right off the bat, um, the, the coding part is, is mind-blowing. So that's e even easier to cheat for students. Uh, yeah, okay. I mean, I mean, it's another tool in the tool bag. But yeah, like my mom teaches um, CSIS3, which is web authoring. I imagine you could put in each one of her assignments and and get almost completed work out of it and and i wouldn't know how to check it exactly okay thank you um and how about mario i have used it a few times to develop some code that i'm writing for a grant that i applied for uh, VR augmentation uh, glasses using the meta glasses. And I have to tell you that, uh, yeah, there's no way for you to prevent anybody from cheating. This thing is so intelligent that, you know, I personally, myself as a cybersecurity instructor at both, uh, several campuses, I wouldn't use it, you know, to write an essay or anything like that because it's, in a, in a sense, where did you get the source? Number two, it's, uh, but when it writes code, Oh my God. I mean, it writes every single uh, character and all arguments and statements very well, and it works. And the code that I'm using using Python to develop the language, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to develop the courses that I teach here at Gavilan um, for cybersecurity using this technology on top of the technology for the VR um, augmentation uh, glasses and develop my courses in there so that students can see the actual event take place. So in other words, I'm showing my students what malware does live, what phishing does live, what it does and how criminal criminals in other countries too are, are, are 
using this type of technology and making it so that they plant seeds in all your servers. And so I show my students how to do that. Now, granted, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm still got a long way to go. But in terms of writing code, this stuff is great. I know Google House has one, but it's not as good as this one. But uh, I, I, I think this product is the future. Um, there's good and bad with it. Uh, but I, but I, but you're absolutely right. It's very difficult to write uh, 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 a well critiqued essay with citations, uh, scholarly citations, and uh, and and not <laughs> not to get into the plagiarism part. Mm -hmm. So it's difficult. Oh, I know it is, but this stuff is fantastic. Mm -hmm. and, I think I'm very glad that you guys uh, decided to put in a uh, an open AI uh, uh, course for today. Um, yeah, like a few of them, but man, I got to tell you, this is and especially if you use the doll too, where you take the pictures, and with the doll too, you can take the pictures and then you can write your own stuff. You can code your own stuff. So that's kind of where I'm leaning to. But this stuff is even better. Yeah. Yeah, the code, job, the code you know. aspect of it is, is kind of astounding. Oh my God. The English language or English classes, I should say, you know, I, I think you're right to be concerned and paying very close attention. So I have a question about um, other disciplines on campus. Um, maybe we could hear from uh, Raylene or David. So I'm taking Raylene's statistics class right now. This is the lab we were doing this morning. This, what GPT produced is what I pasted into my lab number two. Am I cheating or not? I don't know. I think you took the notes and you figured out that it was normally distributed, not symmetric positively skewed. And then my ask was that when you write out the lab report that you write your answer in complete sentences, which is what chat GPT did, but it, it didn't really seem to enhance your original answer too much. So, I mean, to be honest, I'm not teaching English, I'm teaching statistics and yeah, students quite often need help writing the interpretations accurately. So I could almost see this as a assistance for students who are not quite sure how to word it. Now, when I graded it, um, the question we actually asked about the histogram. And so I, instead of saying the data collected does not appear, uh, I might want to see the histogram does not appear to be normally distributed. Okay. Well, that's that's kind of my initial thought on that. Cool. That's kind of that's what I was hoping you would say because that's another part of this is like the great equalizer. You know, I keep saying a tool in the toolbox for somebody who's not a native speaker of English or whatever language. This is a major major equalizer to kind of smooth over the rough spots. Um, what do you think, David? So I, uh, I think uh, I would actually use ChatGPT and I actually teach some of my students how to use ChatGPT to enhance the experience in the class. So what I've learned from my, for instance, teaching physics, if you ask questions that are related to content specific about concepts in physics, since there's so much information, it's so well established, like this is like millions of articles and books out there with the same concepts. If you ask something specific about content in physics, it will give you the right answer. And when you ask certain questions about concepts, it will give you, give you explanations. Most of the time they're correct. Um, when you ask problems solving is that it gets mistakes because it's not still kind of capable of doing logic and math. But as a tool to actually get the concept right, it's like a instantaneous tutor in some sense. And my goal in the class means that I don't have to focus on the low hanging fruit, which is remember um, definitions. They've always had access to Google. They just had to open like different links and it take them longer to actually find the definition or look it up in the textbook. 
ChatGPT actually provides the access to the definition much, much faster. So I can actually focus on like higher order thinking as like critical thinking skills and problem solving. So that's one thing. Another one is what uh, I learned from Peter is essentially is a really good at, uh, you know, helping people who don't know how to code to start coding. So if I want my students to gain skills and become employable in the future, I don't need them to actually learn all the coding languages. They just need a little bit of experience about what coding means. And then ChatGPT can actually provide them with the code in all the languages that are very common, like C++, Java, MATLAB, and Octave. So it's actually helping them, you know, develop their toolbox to actually become employable. So I want them to do that. I want them to experience, you know, I know how to write what is called pseudocode or like in some sense, what is the concept behind the program, but they don't need to know every single specific language. So that's another way in which I would use it. Uh, and finally, I think that even for me for writing, like when I, or I, I wanna, I have something very long to read, it actually summarizes things for me, right? Like I, I, it just makes my life easier. But sometimes I need to know something and it's just like very, very long. I just put it in chat GPT and it gives me the gist of it. And if I find it interesting, then I'll read the whole thing. And maybe students will use it the same way. Maybe they will, you know, if you assign them a reading, they will basically summarize things. And that would actually makes us more conscious about how we create our content. Maybe students don't need to read like everything that we assign them, right? They just they need to learn and they need to get this skills to become employable in the future and develop, you know, what I, I would consider uh, an ability to learn by, them, by themselves. And I think ChatGPT can be a tool that does that. Yeah, I agree. I'm using it as well for code. And if I, I mean, most jobs I can think of, if I was working at, I would be using it now. If I was doing any social media stuff, I would be letting it help me. If I did writing of any kind, I would be letting it help me. Um, yeah, the way that you could put in bullet points and get out full paragraphs or put in full paragraphs and get out bullet points is, is, is very powerful. So um, this one here, this is an Atlantic article that I, you know, I did have to pull it out of the web page and kind of clean up um, their extra text. But if I put that whole thing in and I said, write notes about the following document, use bullet points in complete sentences, use the hyphen character as a bullet point. And it's going to pretty accurately summarize that whole thing. I noticed it isn't perfect. And if I regenerate a few times, I kind of get some variations that I would not like to have missed. Um, but I can think of a ton of stuff where I don't want to, I don't want to read all that text, even email. Go ahead, Jan. Uh, the, the first thing I noticed when um, I saw this presented a, a few months ago <clears throat> was the use of passive language that and you were talking about writing, mm -hmm. and it does. And so when you have flashed various screens today, Peter, I'm noticing almost all the language is passive. The, the mm -hmm. passive verbs, lots of prepositions. They are simple words. So it would work for really basic, you said any kind of writing, for basic newspaper writing, because there are <clears throat> most of them are one and two syllables, they're like comfortable, three syllables, but everybody knows what comfortable means. Um, um, but I, I would say that's actually a fault of it, not a benefit, because good writing uses much more clarity than this is used. And it, good writing will use active as opposed to passive language. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. It is not a good writer. It's an adequate writer, barely adequate writer, a kind of boring corporate sounding writer. I, I should add to that. So that's because ChatGPT was created with that goal. Like there's actually, 
if, if you if you want to look up, these are not free, but there's AI that actually focus on creating what you could you consider artistic work. So there's AI that produces, uh, for instance, art like paintings, right? Would you consider that to be uh, more of a creative task? And it's actually pretty good. Like it's not like as good as like an, a, a human artist, but they have actually submitted this AI work to competitions and it has won. Right, judging by judges, like human judges that didn't know that it was created by AI. And there's like that, the same way there's now Google released something that creates music out of, you know, just uh, words. So it, it, ChatGPT is not meant to actually write uh, book, like I don't know, literature or poems and things like that. If I guess in the future, some companies would like to create that, there's a, they could do that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I predict we'll see the tools, the variations and the different offerings and different companies explode. Um, not much of this technology is patented. It's been kind of the direction of the research for a, going on a decade now, um, including the self-driving cars, the, um, you know, the image recognition. This has been improving slowly for a decade. Uh, Mario? Yeah, it's it's you're absolutely right. It's been a while, uh, and now that the fact that they actually allowed it to come out into the public, and being able to utilize it, but you know, for for my courses for cybersecurity and uh, IT technology and server administration, um, I got to tell you, this is a fantastic product for my for my responsibilities. I, I'm a little bit leery because it, if you understand how malware works, uh, this is an open ticket. And so, wow, this is, how would you, how would you do it without, you know, using uh, this type of product in it? But, um, you know, for writing code, I mean, it does the job, but I'm, for me in my courses, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's it's got to, I have to wait and see how uh, eventually the the overall um, consensus of where it's leading. I know that you have to have a very strong database for this to work very well. Um, I think this would this product, the Chat GPT, would be definitely a product that can be utilized for you know Stanford University libraries, Berkeley libraries, UCLA libraries. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, Library of Congress, where you can research the databases already that are pre-existing and using this chat GBT has the capability to get into that database. It's all based on the database. If you have the database, I think that this would be a phenomenal tool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Uh, yeah. But I mean, it also remember that complexity comes with, uh, with a high cost. I hate to know once you get companies that could establish this, uh, in a more robust way, um, I'm sure it's going to be pretty cost effective. You know how you with the tokens and all. I mean, it adds up. Yeah. Um, you but, know, Mario, what you said about the possibilities of malware struck me because it is its major leverage, and we can see that it already does work. But it's yeah. it's um, you know like a hammer. It's or any yeah. tool. It can be good or bad. Thank you. That's um, exactly right. That's so, exactly right. So the good it guys have it too, in. so to speak. But also, um, one of the major fears, I know even at OpenAI, before they released this, one of the major fears was it being used um, by entities as a source of propaganda, you know, to kind of flood social media or flood letters to the editor with, you know, fake grassroots stuff. Yeah, which you could you could see thing. how that would occur, um, but it go, it goes both ways always. How about yeah, Sabrina? It does. It does. Or somebody, let's let Sabrina talk or Noah. Uh, we just had a question. I just saw a question in the chat. I want to make sure that Craig didn't get overlooked. Um, he asks: Is it is it able to Im imitate or mimic a particular literary literary style? For example, could it write a noir story? That's an excellent question. Um, you know, I played with it a little, but as far as I got was to write a poem in Pirate Talk. 
I I bet you if you're talking about more nuanced literary noir or maybe like pulp fiction or something, I mean, you should try it. But I I kind of think that's beyond it. There's I've given it prompts where it just straight up ignores part of it, and I don't know if if uh, if that's my mistake or if it's just not capable of that. I think T Tiffany would like to see the pirate poem. If you could demonstrate for us. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I just asked it to uh, write a haiku about dogs, and it did. And it was so quick. It was amazing. Oh my God. <laughs> Good. That made her happy. <laughs> Good. Good questions from everybody. Oop, no, you're gonna have to regenerate it. So is that uh, is that your new official poem now? Is that a Peter original? No, well, yeah. Whose is it? It's not mine. So let's let's go back here. We talked a little bit about detecting them. I kind of I said my opinion. I got pushback. That's fine. Um, there will be more and more tools. Um, so um, we've been we, we've been talking about we've been talking about what's going to happen in our classes. I want to I want to reiterate that this isn't the first time this has happened. All the math teachers have had to deal with calculators, you know. Apparently, before I was born, or maybe sometime in the late seventies, calculators cost five hundred dollars, and um, you, you used slide rules or abacus or something. And then these chips got invented and everything changed. Um, Grammarly has been out for a long time, the MS Word grammar checker, even Wikipedia. You know, we've been through stuff like this before and it, it didn't turn out to be the end of the world. So I will repeat myself, try it out, get a feel for it, or talk to younger people who you think are doing it and see what's going on, what their ideas are. I think there's smart ways to cheat with it and some really dumb, lazy ways to cheat with that. And it'll, it'll be easy to catch the dumb ways. And the smart ways to cheat with it, they kind of blur into, you know, the idea of just using it as a tool. So I don't know. I don't know where to draw the line on that. I do think you should at least attempt to come up with some sort of line, attempt to address it in your syllabus next time. Um, at least say what is not acceptable, what is acceptable, how it should be dealt with, um, examples of what you should and shouldn't do. Um, if you want it to be called out or attributed, say how to do that. Um, if you're afraid to let your students know that it exists because you think maybe they haven't heard about it yet, well, I, can, I can certainly sympathize with that, but that'll go away in due time. And, you know, I, I spent some time looking at examples on the internet. There's a lot of teachers out there who have put up their examples of, um, of how they mention it in the syllabus. So you, you definitely won't be the first one. Can uh, I say something real quick about this? Yeah, yeah. We need, to, we need to address, first and foremost, all the different reasons why students cheat. And if we can remove the incentive for it, and it's going to look different for every discipline, every class even. But mm -hmm. once we know why they're doing it and remove that incentive, which gets to the heart of like, why, like, what are we doing in the classroom? What is it that we're trying to teach them? Am I really teaching them how to write an essay? If an AI can do it, then what's the point of teaching them to do it? That's not really what I'm getting at, though. And there are other ways, like Tiffany said, of evaluating, too. We're going to get into all of that in this workshop that we're doing. 
But I think that's where we need to start is why, why do students cheat in the first place? And is there a way to remove the incentive for it rather than forming an adversarial relationship with them and trying to catch them in the act, which is shitty and I hate that, it's, it's terrible. No, that's good. You just predicted the last slide of this presentation, which is what exactly are we teaching? Are we teaching a standard five paragraph essay? And is that something that can just be generated at the touch of a button? And, and, um, and therefore, is it a useful skill or do we need to refine what the skills are that matter? The um, Nature Magazine and the Medium.com have written some really good articles and I'll send out this presentation. Those are links. They've written really good articles about how they are um, approaching the same issue because it's a, it's a major deal for, for publications also. Um, I hey, believe Peter? it's an equalizer, yeah. Really quickly, um, before I go, because I got to go to this other Zoom, but I just want to tell you that, you know, I appreciate you guys and Sabrina and everyone in this meeting uh, having this event. Um, I thought, you know, bringing uh, GBT, chat GBT to Gavlin is absolutely phenomenal, fantastic, and I really appreciate it. you guys invited me. I have to tell you that um, this is... Uh, I, I love the technology. I really do. I'm all about forward and new innovative ideas and, 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 and whatnot. But for my courses, I was telling you earlier, for my courses in cybersecurity, and I got to tell you, it comes down to ethics. It comes down to the ethics of humans. That's what I've been, it's what I, what I feel about it so far, what I've used it for. And, um, you know, it's, 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 it's like the lady previously to me, it's about cheating, whether or not, why do students really cheat when, you know, the, we're showing them, we spend hours lecturing them, showing them, we spend hours after school, showing them open hours, even time off, I do it. And you still get one or two that go in there and sneak their way in there and using a product like this, what, what would prevent them from, you know, cheating. So, but you know, this product could be aligned in a way where, you know, you have to cite your sources, you have to be able to uh, 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 make sure that you have the capability to uh, present where your work. And at the same time, it could be a better tool than we really think it is. Even more fantastic, because if the student mm -hmm. is going to cheat, they're going to cheat regardless, right? We already know they're going to cheat. Students cheat no matter what. At any institution, they always do. They try to get away with it. But and with this product, it, it, it does need a little bit of tweaking. But I think eventually we're going to see this capability where it, it, they are not going to be able to cheat that easily. Yep, I agree. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for having me, you guys. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else? Um. Yeah, I, I wanted to, um, more about the coding. I was wondering like if we would have to change our uh, assignments to also give an explanation of each line or commented code, detailed commented code. It can add comments to code too. It does. So. It can add explanations. It can explain code really well. You know, um, I, I put this together thinking of English teachers and like I knew coding was an issue. I, I, but I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about the implications. Um, I actually read an article. There's a lot of computer science instructors that are feeling the same way. Like basically, I, I don't, I don't know if this is the way you use the when you, when you teach coding. You essentially give them assignments, and there's actually already tools that you can use for grading because grading code is probably one of the most boring things in the world, right? Nobody wants to read other people's code. Uh, so it makes it really impossible to actually grade the um, assignments or anything that you would do it online because students will have the incentive and they know that this is just going to generate the code, provide the comments, and you, the instructor will never actually sit down and check it because it's extremely boring. So I think that a lot of instructors that teach computer science go back to the old methods, what they used to do when I started to learn how to code, which is the exams are by hand, right? Yeah. Like to write the pseudocode. 
not to actually write the programs themselves with the code in Java, but to write a pseudo code in a piece of paper in class. Yep. That's what I've seen a lot of instructors say that they are doing in computer science. Maybe there's, mm -hmm. I guess, more meaningful solutions in the long term, but that's what they are doing right now. Yeah. Um, David, uh, what did you say? Writing what kind of code? By hand, um, uh, pseudo code, right? Pseudo code. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is that the kind of stuff they would be doing in a career of coding? Like, well, is it? Just, in, are you doing that head. Just, in your is head? It just, just to yeah. try to get them to stop cheating, though, or is it like, what is it teaching them? Is it teaching them? It's just teaching them how to code, but it's yeah. testing that they do know how to code. Yeah, it's it's an evaluation more than it is a, like a teaching yeah. tool. Yeah. So, Erin, actually, if, if you go to, I don't know, I'm pronouncing this correctly, pseudocode, that is the meaningful part about coding. Like the the language itself, like the 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 syntax of the language is not as important. Uh, that's essentially if you go to a job interview, they will they will be testing for. And sometimes they will ask you in job interviews to do pseudocode, not to do in a specific language. Unless they're, the company is working with C++ or Java, they will ask you to do very specific things. Um, so I, I think it, it is still meaningful, but it, it, what, it, what it does to the student is actually, the, the reason why I think computer science went into doing the exams and the, the things and the activities in the computer is because that's what the student wants to do in computer science. They wanna sit down in their computer and code. They don't wanna be doing a piece of paper that's kind of boring and like defeats the purpose. So that's the issue. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Sarah. Um, used to teach graduate students uh, various uh, codes, uh, and he he would ask them to present their their codes in class. I mean, this is a computer science project, mm -hmm. and he said one student started crying when he asked her to do that because mm -hmm. she hadn't done it at all. Her husband did it, mm -hmm. so you know everybody else could explain. She had no idea. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a legitimate way also. It drives us introverted types nuts, but, but we get over it. Um, any anybody else have comments? Yeah, this is the classic job. Um, you know, employment interview coding question is really simple. But if, you, if you're not getting it, um, you won't get this question. Um, so that I'm gonna think more about computer science, you know, that's what I do. And so I immediately just saw it as an awesome tool and I'm, oops, I am mercenary, you know, I'll use anything that makes my job easier. That's kind of why we all turned towards computers in the first place. So, um, and I mostly taught myself how to do it. So there weren't, there wasn't anything to think of as cheating, but I want to, I want to go more in the direction of um, the ways that students and teachers can actually use this to learn or in the classroom. Um, this is stuff that I've already been doing. I showed off some of these. What are the keywords? What's the one sentence summary of this text? These links, um, people have been getting really creative. You know, the nature of this thing is it's so wide open that you and I are not even realizing the possibilities um, that are out there. So if you want to kind of um, check out even more ideas, then go through these links. One that David brought up is uh, just its ability to go back and forth like Socratic method. Um, to explain something, to question it, to, you know, for, I think that would be really good for ESL, all of physics and biology was, what do you mean by this? And how do you, what is a derivative versus an integral? What does it mean? That, that's kind of using it almost as a substitute for Google, which it's being, it's turning out to be a real good question answer and in the context of learning stuff. That's incredible. And of course, teachers can use all of this um, in their, their struggles with the bureaucracy. Um, Aaron, this is, this is where I finally ended up is what exactly 
are we teaching when we're teaching writing? Um, then what is what is it that we're trying to accomplish? Um, so just as, um, as teachers, how are you all feeling, especially versus before, before this workshop? How are you all feeling about this tool and what it's gonna mean for your course? Anybody still have major misgivings or, you know, paranoia? Martha? I'm, I'm since listening to the podcast and I've read two or three different articles and a couple of editorials in the newspaper and stuff and played around with my husband's, I, and, and done some discussion groups with people on, um, in, online. If I'm not feeling as concerned as I was initially, especially after putting my prompts in um, and, and having it say, throw up its hands and say, sorry, I can't do that. Um, so I'm actually feeling pretty comfortable with it. And I, and I'm trying right now to create a class, um, like one lesson around chat GPT and its limitations and what it can do well and what it can't. And I just have to work on it. It probably won't happen until, um, next semester, but, um, I think it's something that we all have to kind of address in one way or another. Mm -hmm. It's not going away. Turn it in, we'll come up with something and it'll be built into our canvas within six months, I predict. Um, Meanwhile, though, we see this as an opportunity. Once we start letting turn it in, solve all of our problems for us, then we're just as disengaged from the process as the students who are cheating. So mm -hmm. right now is a good time to actually explore some of these larger issues so that we're not just relying on AI to catch AI. Mm -hmm. Thought. Microsoft bought this essentially, which means it's going to go into Office and Outlook and Word. So I, I saw one meme that was somebody scribbled out an idea, it got translated into paragraphs to get transmitted, and then the person on the other end translated it back into a couple of words of bullet points. And um, that, that seemed poignant for some reason. Yeah, it's already in Bing. I think they've had a rough rollout with that. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Peter. The one in Bing is not really ChatGPT. They didn't implement it. They do their own thing, right? Because I was. I, well, they just spent ten billion on OpenAI. I I can't believe they would do their own thing, but it, it it's different. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't used it. I've just been seeing internet stuff. It it seems pretty different. So I I don't know exactly what they did. Yeah. Um, do you remember when Siri and Alexa came out and we kind of for a minute we thought it was going to be this like smart assistant and then it turned out to be really dumb I think this is this is the time that we get Siri that is actually smart we'll see we'll see ourselves talking to our computers way more <clears throat> the so Google I is in an open beta um, and they kind of they kind of had it do a mistake uh, in a big major public demonstration, but it's it's happening. They're they're at the forefront of this. Uh, Peter, I just want to say something. Uh, so uh, as part of the STEM after this ChatGPT uh, session, I, I I was gonna do exactly what um, Aaron suggested. I, I thought that this was a good reason to actually motivate instructors in our discipline to take a good look at the way we are trying to assess our students, uh, to modify the assessments in a meaningful way and actually address that question is, what actually incentivizes our students to cheat such that we reduce the amount of cheating, in, whether it's using ChatGPT, Google, or uh, Check. Uh, but I think on the follow-up uh, session that I, want, that I wanted the STEM uh, division to have was to essentially do assessment and incentives in some sense. Uh, and I, I don't know if the, there is interest from all of the faculty, 
maybe it's not, it's not only going to be STEM, then I, I'll, I'll be happy to have a bigger session with all the different, uh, you know, faculty members at Gavilan. I think there's interest. It sounds like it. There's a committee for that, the Meaningful Assessment Committee. We talk about stuff like that. We could use more people from the STEM side of things on that committee, honestly. I forget who's the chair. Now Kyle's not the chair anymore. Tiffany, do you know who the chair is for that committee? Is it Max? No, I don't know. Oh, Max, okay. Maybe, I could be wrong. Max Rain, yeah. There's not a lot of STEM voices in that committee though. It would be great to have some. Thank you. It's Jen. Oh, it is Jen McMillan. Okay. Yeah, I am interested in that, David, and also, um, Aaron, anything that the English department is doing? Um, I'm, I'm totally curious. This is fascinating. I'm really glad so many people showed up. Thank you very much. I will send out the, my slides and my links to, to everybody, and um, I appreciate it. So thank you. Thank you, Peter.